What's up guys, it's Henry Lee and in this video, I read the book Captain Underpants and the Attack of the Talking Toilets, the second epic novel by Dave Pauke. Let's go right into it. Um, hello, before you read this book, there's some things you should know. So Harold and I have created this informative pamphlet to fill you in on the details. Please don't let this comic fall into the wrong hands. If you watched the video Captain Underpants Sharp 1 audiobook, you can just skip this part, okay? It's just telling what they did in the first epic novel. The top secret truth about Captain Underpants by George Beard and Harold Hutchins, who deny everything. Once upon a time, there were two cool kids named George and Harold. They're cool, me too. They made their own comics about a superhero named Captain Underpants. Everybody thought their comics were funny, except for their mean old principal, Mr. Krupp. One time, Mr. Krupp was being mean to George and Harold, so they bought a 3D hymnal ring. They hypnotized Mr. Krupp, then they turned him into Captain Underpants. But Mr. Krupp thought he really was Captain Underpants. He jumped out the window to fright crime. George and Harold tried to stop him, but they had to save the road for them. When they got back to school, George poured water on Captain Underpants' head. He turned back into Mr. Krupp, but something was wrong. Because now, for some strange reason, every time Mr. Krupp hears somebody snap their fingers, snap, he turns back into Captain Underpants. So whatever you do, please don't snap your fingers around Mr. Krupp. Please, 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 don't snap those fingers. This has been the public service announcement from George and Harold. Still deny everything. The end. Chapter 1. George and Harold. This is George Beard and Harold Hutchins. George is the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top. Harold is the one on the right with the t-shirt and the bad haircut. Remember that now. You have to sign George Stu's furniture. Come in and see our pretty armchair. I think they're changing it. Here's the picture. Depending on who you asked, you probably hear a lot of different things about George and Harold. Their teacher, Miss Ribble, might say that George and Harold were disruptive and behaviorally challenged. Their gym teacher, Mr. Meaner, might add that they were in serious need of a major attitude adjustment. The principal, Mr. Krupp, would probably have a few more choice words to include, like sneaky and criminally mischievous, and I'll get those boy if it's the last thing I, well, you get the idea. But if you ask your parents, they'll probably tell you that George and Harvard were smart and sweet and very good hard, even if they were a bit silly at times. I have to agree with their parents. Oh, Jordan Harold changed the sign to Jules Furniture. Come and see our hairy armpits. Oh, yeah. But even so, their silliness did get them into a lot of trouble sometimes. In fact, it once got them into so much trouble, they accidentally almost destroyed the whole planet with an army of evil, vicious talking toilets. But before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this story. Chapter 2, The Story One fine morning after Ron Morris Elementary School, George and Harold had just gotten out after four straight re remedial gym class when they saw a big sign in the hallway. It was an announcement for the second annual invention convention. George and Harold had fond memories of last year's invention convention, but this year's convention was a bit different. The first prize winner got to be principal for the day. Wow, said George. Whoever gets to be principal gets to make up all the rules for the whole day, and everybody in school has to follow those rules. You have got to win first prize this year, exclaimed Harold. Just then, George and Harold's principal, Mr. Crump, showed up. Aha, he shouted. I bet you two are up to no good. Not really, said George. We were just reading about this year's contest. 
Yeah, the Tarot. We're going to be who win first prize in the contest and be principal for the day. Ha 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 ha! That's Mr. Crip. Do you honestly think I'd let you two enter this year's contest after that stunt you pulled out last year's invention convention? George and Haro smiled and thought back to the first annual invention convention. Chapter 3 The Flashback. It was about one year earlier, and while of the faculty and students of Jeromorris Elementary School had gathered in the gymnasium for what would later be known as the sticky chair incident. George and Haro stepped up to the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, said George. Harold and I have invented something that's guaranteed to keep you all glued to your seats. Yes, said Harold. We call it glue. As the crowd became very angry. You two did not invent glue, he shouted. He stood up to take the microphone away from Harold. This chair stood up with him. Everyone in the gymnasium laughed. The school security, Mr. Androp, stood up to help remove Mr. Crub's chair from his pants. Her chair stood up with her, too. Everyone in the gymnasium laughed harder. The other teacher stood up and, you guessed it, they were stuck to the chairs as well. Everyone in the audience howled with laughter. One kid stood up to go to the bathroom and his chair came up with him also. The audience stopped laughing so hard. They all quickly checked their chairs and suddenly the laughter stopped completely. Everyone in the whole school was glued to their seats. You see, while it was true that George and Harold had not invented glue, they had invented a new kind of glue. By simply mixing rubber cement with concentrated orange juice mix, they had created a quick drying, body heat activated glue. And they applied this special glue to every seat in the gymnasium except theirs early that morning. Everybody in the gymnasium was glaring at George and Harold and seething with anger. Got a good idea, said George. What? asked Harold. Run! cried George. George and Harold were grinning from ear to ear, remembering their silly invention and the chaos that followed. That was hilarious, laughed Harold. Yeah, echoed George. It'll be hard on top with this year. Well, you won't get a chance this year, said Mr. Krupp. He took out a magnifying glass and held it up to the fine print on the sign. This contest is open to all students in the third and fourth grade except George Beard and Harold Hutchins. You mean we can't enter the contest? asked Harold. It's worse than that, laughed Mr. Krupp. The boys can't even attend this year's convention. I'm putting you two in study hall that whole day. Mr. Krupp turned and walked away laughing victoriously. Rass, said Haro. What are we going to do now? Well, said George, you no, know the old thing. We can't join him. Beat him. Chapter 4 The Invention. Early that evening, George and Haro sneaked back to school with their supplies. He crept into the gymnasium and peeked around. Is somebody still in here? whispered Haro. Oh, that's Melvin Sneedley, said George. Melvin was the school brainiac. He was busy putting some last minute touches on his new invention for the contest. We should wait here until he leaves, whispered Harold. No way, said George. You'll be here all night. Let's just go over and talk to him. When Melvin saw George and Harold approaching, he was not happy. Oh no, he said. I bet you guys are here to mess with everybody's invention. Nice guess, said George. Listen, we promise not to mess with your invention. If you promise not to tell anybody that you saw us here tonight, we will look lovingly at his invention and will reluctantly agree. I promise, he said. Great, said George. Say, what is that invention of yours anyway? It just looks like a photocopy machine. Well, it used to be a photocopy machine, said Melvin, but I've made some major adjustments to it. Now it is an invention that will revolutionize the world. I call it the Passy 2000. I revolutionize the world. And you name it Passy? asked Harold. Yes, 
the movement. Passy is an acronym for photoatomic transsongobolate yeto fran I'm sorry I asked, said Harold. Allow me to demonstrate, said Melvin. The Passy 2000 can take any one dimensional image and create a living, breathing three dimensional copy of that image. For example, take this ordinary photograph of a mouse. Melvin placed a photo of the mouse onto the glass screen of the Passy 2000 and pressed start. The lights in the gymnasium dimmed as all the power in the entire school seemed to get sucked into the Passy 2000. The machine began to vibrate and hum loudly. Tiny bolts of static electricity snapped out from underneath. I hope that thing doesn't explode, said Haru. Oh, this is nothing. Melvin, you should have seen how the Passy 2000 reacted when I copied a poodle. Finally, after seeing the flashes and loud zaps, everything stopped. A small ding was heard. Then a tiny mouse crawled out the side door of the Passy 2000 and onto the floor. Isn't it wonderful? exclaimed Melvin. George inspected the mouse closely. That's a great trick, George laughed. Really had me going for a while. It's not a trick, cried Melvin. Passy 2000 really does bring photos to life. I've even created living creatures from paintings and drawings. Yeah, right, laughed Harold. I thought we were con artists. George and Harvard walked away chuckling. It was time to move on to bigger and better things. Chapter 5, Bigger and Better Things. George and Harvard went to the other end of the gymnasium, opened their backpacks, and began to work. George busied himself by turning all the strain nozzles on the automatic dog washer around, while Harold filled up the soap tank with India ink. Then they moved on the volcano detector. You please pass me a, a big bag of butterscotch puzzling and a Phillips head screwdriver, Taro. Sure, said George, as he carefully inserted X into the electric ping pong ball server. Chapter 6 The Invention Convention. The following day started out sunny and cheerful. The students. The faculty filled into the gymnasium and checked the seats very carefully before sitting down. Greetings, said Mr. Krupp, who was standing up at the microphone. No need to worry about sticky seats today, he said. I'm taking measures to ensure that this invention convention won't be a disaster like last year's. Everyone settled and asked Madison Man Kenny, a third grader, stepped on stage to demonstrate her automatic dog washer. First, said Madison, put your dog in the tub. Then you press this button. Madison pressed the start button. At first, nothing happened. Then suddenly, a spread of inky black water sprayed up and out over the crowd. Everyone except the dog soaked. Got soaked. As Madison tried desperately to turn off the sprayers. I can't stop it, he cried. Someone turned all the nozzles around. Now who could have done that? And Mr. Krupp. Next up was Donnie Schumier with his electric ping pong ball server. He turned the machine on and immediately it began hurling extra large great eggs into the crowd. Foo, foo, foo. Foof, foof, but the machine splash, 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 went the eggs. I can't turn the machine off, cried Donnie. Somebody jammed the paper club into the controller. Now who could have done that, asked Miss Ribbo. Freddie Moore's volcano detector was also a big flop. When Freddie connected the circuits to the 9-volt battery, it, a large spring, which had been crammed into... The center of his miniature volcano launched a giant plastic bag of butterscotch pudding high into the crowd. It landed somewhere between the third and fourth booths. Flat. Hey, whined Freddy. Somebody put pudding in my volcano. Now who could have done that? asked Mr. Meaner. The rest of the day went on much the same way, with people shouting everything. From hey, who put oatmeal in my solar power leaf blower? 
Hey, let all the mice out of my treadmill, Dun Booksy. It wasn't long before everyone flowed the gymnasium and the second annual invention convention had to be called off. How could this have happened? cried Mr. Crib as he wiped chocolate syrup, pencil shavings, and cream of mushroom soup off his face and shirt. Gordon Harvard has been in the study all, all day long. I put them there myself. Um, excuse me, Mr. Crub, said Melvin Sneely. I think I have an answer to your question. Chapter 7, Busted. Crash went the door to the study hall room. Mr. Crub stomped in like a crazy person. Gordon Harvard had never seen him this upset before. Boys are in so much trouble, Mr. Krebs shouted, and putting you to on permanent detention for the rest of the school year. Wait a second, cried George. You can't prove anything. Yeah, the tall road. I've been here all day. Mr. Krebs smiled devilishly and looked toward the door. Oh, Melvin, he called. Melvin Sneely stepped into the room covered in mustard, egg shoes, and shattered coconut. They did it, Melvin said. Pointing at George and Harold, I saw him last night in the gym. Melvin, cried George, horrified. You promised. I changed my mind, Melvin said, grinning smugly. Have fun in detention. Chapter 8, The Invention Convention Detention. After school, Mr. Crump assured George and Harold into the detention room and wrote a long sentence on the chalkboard. From now on, growled Mr. Crump. The boys would spend two hours a day after school copying this sentence over and over. And when every chalkboard in this room filled completely on his way out door, door Mr. Crab turned and said with an evil grin, And if either of you leaves this room for any reason, I'm going to suspend you both. Now, as you might have guessed, writing sentences was nothing new to George and Harold. The two boys waited until Mr. Crab left the room. They each took four homemade wooden rods out of their backpacks. The rods had holes in them that George and Harold had drilled in George's dad's wood shop. George screwed the rods together, while Harold inserted a piece of chalk into each hole. Then they each took a pole and began copying Mr. Crow's sentence. Every time they wrote one sentence, the wooden poles made twelve. After about three and a half minutes, Every chalkboard in the room was completely filled. Jordan Harwood sat down and admired your work. We've got a lot of time on our hands now, said George. Got any ideas? Let's make a new comic book, said Harwood. So the two boys took out some paper and pens and created an all new adventure about their favorite superhero. It was called Captain Underpants and the Attack of the Talking Toilets. Chapter 9. Captain Underpants and the Attack of the Talking Toolless by George Beard and Harold Hutchins. One day at school, everything was pretty normal. The lunch ladies were serving toasted wrap sandwiches. The principal was yelling, blah, blah, blah. And the gym teacher was being mean to everybody. A grandma can run faster than you guys. Then a UFO appeared. That the school was an evil ray. The rain made all of the toilets come to life and make them evil too. The toilets were hungry. Yum yum, eat them up. So they ate the gym teacher. Help! The toilets just scratched somebody's car and ate up the gym teacher. Lord have mercy. What was in my car? This looks like a jaw for crash. Captain Underpants! Captain Underpants ran to the storage room. Yum yum, eat them up. You found a bunch of hungers, hundreds. You put them into the toilets. Their mouths got stuck. Trillala! Hooray for Captain Underpants! Not to stop that evil UFO. Oh. Captain Underpants went outside and saw the UFO. It opened up, click, and out jumps the terrible Terminator 2000. A slush shoe. They had a big fight. Captain Underpants was faster than a speeding waistband, more powerful than boxer shoes, tra-la-la, and able to leap tall buildings without getting a wedgie. Captain Underpants snuck up behind the Turbo Tool in 2000 and gave him a wedgie. Wedgie power, ouchie! Then he hung the TT 2000 in a stop sign and pulled back hard, stretch, 
Then he let go. Tram, kaboom! The spaceship blew up and all the toilets returned to normal. Hooray! And the gym teacher ex escaped. Aw, oh, man. The end. Trio's Comics I and C. Yep. They was Trio's Comics I and C. I don't know why. If they made it in the trials, I think that's why. Chapter 10. A big mistake. Kirk and Hara sat together in their detention room, reading through their newest comic book and beaming proudly. Got to go to the office and make copies of this, said George, so we can sell them on the playground tomorrow. We can't, said Harold. Don't you remember? Mr. Crow said he'd suspend us if he caught us leaving this room. Then we won't let him catch us, said George. Gordon Harlow sneaked out of the room quietly and crawled down the hall to the office. Uh-oh, said Harold. There's a bunch of teachers in there. I never forget to use the copy machine. Hmm, said George. Are there any other copy machines in the school? How about the one that Melvin had in the gym? Asked Harold. Oh, yeah, said George. George and Harold crept over to the gym and found the Patsy 2000. I wonder if this machine still makes copies, said Harold. Melvin did say that he had made some adjustments to it. Oh, he probably just crammed the mouth in there to fool us, said George. The oldest trick in the book. I'm sure the machine still makes regular copies. George placed the cover of their new comic book face down on the glass screen and pressed start. All at once, the lights in the whole school dimmed, and the passing to tell them began to shake and clunk around wildly. And both the static electricity zapped out the bottom of the machine as a great whirlwind rose from the top. Newspapers and other small objects in the room were sucked into the wind and they spun above the machine like a raging cyclone. I don't think it's supposed to do this, shouted George over the horrible noise. Finally, after a series of flashes and loud zaps, the noise went and sparks stopped altogether. The only sound that could be heard was of something groaned and clawing about inside the bloated, battered frame of the past C2000. It sounds like something's alive inside there, said Harold. Gurr snatched the comic book from the top of the machine. Machine. Let's get right off. Let's Get out of here, he cried. But then a small thing was heard, and a full size, shiny white toilet emerged from the side of the past C2000. Its teeth were sharp and jacked, and its angry white balls glowed with red, swollen veins. Yum yum, eat them up, cried the evil toilet. Almost immediately, another talking toilet emerged, followed by another, and another, and another. Yum yum, eat them up, they cried. Oh no, Melvin was right. The photoatomic transom gobulating Yinko fan trip fluke tons Nick Zan Sips Tom Sir really does create eleven freezing three dimensional copies, one dimensional images. Coward cried convolutedly. I've got an idea, said George. What? asked Howard. Run, cried George. Chapter 11, The Invention, Convention, Detention, Suspension. George and Harwood screamed and ran out the gym door, closing it tightly behind them. Aha! Yeah, Mr. Crab, who was just coming down the hall. Boys left the detention room. You know what that means, don't you? It wasn't our fault, cried Harwood. Too bad, Mr. Crab shouted with delight. The boys are officially suspended. Wait, cried George, you've got to listen. Behind the door is an army of evil, vicious talk. I don't have to listen to you boys ever again, laughed Mr. Crub. Now get your stuff and get out of this school. But, but, Horace stammered, you don't understand. Get out, Mr. Crub screamed. George and Harold groaned and walked to their lockers to collect their stuff. Gosh, said Harold, and one day we've got in a detention, a suspension, and we've created an army of evil talking toilets who want to take over the road. That's a pretty bad day, even by your standards, said George. Oh, well, said Harold, I just hope things don't get any worse. Chapter 12, Things Get Worse. 
Word spread quickly throughout the office that Jordan Harwood had been suspended. The teacher rushed out to cheer and laugh at the two boys. You're in big trouble now, chuckled Miss Anthrope. I can't wait to call your parents and tell them the news. Let's take your desks outside and chop them up, cried Miss Ribble. Let's throw a party in the gym, she shouted Mr. Meaner. No, cried George. Whatever you do, don't open the door to the gym. We can do whatever we like, snarled Miss Meaner as he dashed over to the gymnasium door. Look, I'm opening the door. He quickly opened the gym door. Now I'm closing the door, he said. Now I'm opening the door again, and now I'm... Ah! Manivo Torless had stuck his mouth through the door, snapped Mr. Meaner up, and swallowed him whole. Flush! The talking Torless then pushed their way through the open gym, nasium doors, and spilled out into the hallway. Yum yum eat them up, the Torless below. Yum yum eat them up, glah! The teachers couldn't believe their eyes. They screamed and ran for their lives. Only Mr. Krupp, Miss Ribble, and George and Harvey remained, frozen in fear. They watched, paralyzed, as the talking toilets came nearer and nearer. Finally, Miss Ribble pointed at the toilets and snapped her fingers. Snap! Go away, she cried. Go away this minute. But the toilets didn't listen. They moved closer and closer. Finally, Miss Ribble turned and ran. Mr. Krupp, however, just stood there in a daze. George and Harold looked up at him. Uh-oh, said Harold. Did she just snap her fingers? Yep, said George. Now you're really in trouble. And George was right. For at that moment, Mr. Krupp had begun to change. A silly, heroic smile came over his face as he stood defiantly before his foes. I put a stop to you, thou villains, he said fearlessly, but first I need some supplies. The crook turned and dashed to his office. George and Harwell ran after him. Why did Miss Ribble have to snap her fingers, cried George. Harwell wrote, why? Never mind dad, cried George. Mr. Crub is turning into Captain Underpants. Forgot to pour water over his head before it's too late. Chapter 13, it's too late. When George and Harlow reached Mr. Crump's office, they found only his clothes, shoes, and two pee on the floor. Look, said Harold, the window is open and one of the red curtains is missing. What do we do now? asked George. Do we save Captain Underpants or do we stay here and get eaten by a bunch of toilets? Hmm, let me think about that one, said Harold as he climbed out the window. Bird quickly collected Mr. Crump's things and shoved them into his backpack. Then he jumped out the window after Harold. The two boys slid down the flagpole and ran off after Captain Underpants. Hans. Where does he think he's going? asked George. I have no idea, said Harold. But we better run fast because they think we're being followed. Captain Underpants dashed through the backyards of some nearby houses and collected pairs of underwear from the clothesline. Mommy, said the little boy looking out his window, a man in the red cape just stole our underwear. And now two boys being chased by a ferocious looking toilet with sharp, pointy teeth screaming, yum yum, eat him up. Yeah, right, laughed his mother. Just how gullible do you think I am? She's reading the book, How to Lose 20 Pounds in Three Days. Those are, those are all useless. In the past, yeah, maybe yesterday, keep watching books like how to get 1,000 subscribers in a day in 30 days. This is all completely useless. Chapter 14, The Talking Toilet Takeover. When Captain Underpants was finished commandering the underwear of local civilians, he dashed back to Jerome Horace Elementary to save the day. The school was now overrun with chaos. The Stribble came tearing out the door, followed by several evil toilets. Help me, she cried. They swallowed every teacher in the whole building except me. Don't worry, ma'am. I won't let them eat you up, Captain Underpants said as the toilet ate her up. Oops, said Captain Underpants. Now only George, Harold, and Captain Underpants were left. 
They stood on the front lawn of the school, completely surrounded by hungry, drooling toilets. Yum yum, eat them up, the talking toilets chanted. Yum yum, eat them up. Yum yum, eat them up. Yum yum, eat them up. We're doomed, cried George Harrow. Never underestimate the power of a thunderwear, cried Captain Underpants, as he stretched and shot underwear into the waiting mass of the talking toilets. Unfortunately, the toilets just swallowed the underwear whole. It only seemed to make them hungrier and hungrier. Oh, if only we could think of something that would make them really sick, said George. Yeah, or continued. Something so vile and disgusting, it would make them all blow their cookies and red and gone. Suddenly, George and Haru's face flipped up. Cafeteria food, they shouted. And faster than the speed of waistband, our three heroes dashed into the school. Chapter 15, Cream Chip Beef to the Rescue. George, Haru, and Captain Underpants got inside the school safely and closed the front door behind them. I think the tools are all outside, said George. Not for long, said Harold. Quickly, they ran to the school's kitchen and discovered a cart of holding a large vat of something green and sludgy. Yuck, said George, holding his nose. What is that stuff? I think it's tomorrow's lunch, said Harold. Perfect, said George. I never thought I'd be glad to see cream chip buff. Together, they wheeled the tub of stinky green glop down the hallway and out the side door of the school. Captain Underpants sat on the cart and stretched a pair of underwear over his head like a slingshot. George stood over him, scooped some cafeteria food into the underwear, and stretched it back. Harold wheeled the cart toward the talking to toilets. Trellala! shouted Captain Underpants loudly. The talking toilets turned and saw our three heroes. All at once they shouted yum yum eat him up as the chase and the chase was on. Doc! Harold pulled the cart across the playground as the tools zipped after them. Fire one! cried Captain Underpants. George shot a glob of cream chip beef into the first toolless mouth. The toolless swallowed a toe. Carol kept pulling as George scooped another serving into the underwear and pulled it back. Or two, cried Captain Underpants. Zip with the cafeteria food right into the second toilet's mouth. The whole process repeated itself until every last toilet had swallowed at least two servings of green chip beef. We're almost out of ammo, Captain Underpants shouted. And I don't think I can run anymore, said Harold, huffing and puffing. Don't worry, look, said George, pointing at the toilet. They'd all slowed down and were beginning to groan and wobble around. Their eyes crossed, and they turned an odd shade of green. The gal, cried Harold, think they're gonna hurl. And that's just what they did. George, Harold, and Captain Underpants watched as the toilet upchucked. Everything they had eaten during the day. The cream chip beef, the underwear, even the teachers all came with, out without a scratch. Then the toilet spun around in small circles and fell to the ground. Then George checked the teachers. They're alive, he said. Unconscious, but alive. Wow, said Harold. That was easy. Too easy, said George. What do you mean? asked Harold. George pulled their comic book out of his backpack and showed it to Haru. Remember how the Passy 2000 turned everything on the front cover of our comic book to life? He asked. Yeah, so? said Haru. Well, said George, as he pointed to the Turbo Toilet 2000 on the front cover of the comic. We haven't seen him yet. Chapter 16, the Turbo Toilet 2000. Suddenly, the Turbo Toilet 2000 came charging out of the front door of the school with the terrible crash. The earth rumbled beneath its mighty footsteps as nearly a ton of twisting steel and raging proclaimed descended upon our heroes. Crash! The three meddling fools may have destroyed my army of talking toilets. Green the Turbo Toilet 2000, but you're all out of cafeteria food. How are you gonna stop me? I'll tell you how, Captain Underpants said bully. With wedgie power. Wait, Captain Underpants, screamed George. 
can't fight that thing. He'll rip you to pieces. Boys, the captain and the best knobbly. You must fight valiantly for truth, justice, and all that is pre strength and costly. Captain Underpants leaped onto the Turbo Toilet 2000 and the battle began. I sure hope this doesn't lead to extremely graphic violence, said Harold. Me too, said George. Chapter 17 Extremely Graphic Violence Chapter Part 1 and Flipperama. Warning The following chapter contains intense scenes showing a man in his underwear battling a giant toilet. Please do not try this at home. Flip around. Go right into it. Ready power versus potty power. Yeah, it's having underpants one. Oh no, the potty power punch three veils. Alright. Flip around at three. The carnivorous commode captures the captain. Yeah. Chapter 18, Harold and the Purple Ball Point Pin. Everything seemed hopeless. Captain Underpants had slipped and fallen into the mouth of the Turbo Tula 2000, and now the giant Tula was coming after Jordan Harold. Ha <laughs> ha ha ha! Laughed the powerful pro proclaim predator. Once they have eaten you two kids up, I'll take over the road. Not if they have anything to say about it, yo George. Jordan R. ran into the school and locked the door behind them. The Turbo Dola 2000 banged against the door with his fist, shouting, You boys can't hide in there forever! Jordan Harbour ran to the gym. I've got a plan, said George. We need to invent a character who can defeat a giant robot toilet. How about a giant robot urino? asked Harold. We can call it the urinator. No way, said George. They'll never let us get away with that in the children's book. It's getting on thin ice as it is. All right, said Harold. How about a giant plunger robot? You can carry a really big plunger and... That's it, cried George. So Harold took out his purple ballpoint pen and began to draw. Give him laser eyes, said George. All right, said Harold. And make him obey our every command, said George. I'm way ahead of you, said Harold. Harold finished his drawing, and George inspected it carefully. It just might work, said George. Yeah, said Harold. If the Pathy 2000 can hold out, the boys turned and looked at the detented, cracked, and beaten up machine laying on his side in the corner. George and Harold pushed the Pathy 2000 upright and dusted it off. Come on, Pathy, old girl, said George. We really need you now. Yeah, said Harold. The fate of the entire planet is in our hands. Chapter 19. The Incredible Robo Plunger. George took Harold's picture and placed it on the screen of the passing 2000 and press start. Lights around them Then, as the weary machine began to shake and smoke. Lightning bolts zapped, thunder clapped, and the whole gymnasium shook with photoatomic transmogulatory yectofran trip photon zipic energy. Come on, Patsy! George shouted over the horrible noise. You can do it, baby! Finally, a small ding was heard, and the Patsy 2000 coughed up with a huge metallic behemoth. It rose up and stood valiantly before George and Harold. It was the incredible Robo Plunger. Hooray! cried George. It worked! Way to go, Patsy! Harold cheered. Now let's get outside and kick some Turbo Tolls Tushy. Chapter 20 the Extremely Graphic Violence Chapter Part 2 Flipperama. Notice The following chapter contains terribly naughty scenes depicting a giant toilet getting a shiny, shiny kick. All toilet violence was carefully monitored by PTT, People for the Ethical Treatment of Toilets. No actual toilets were harmed during the making of the chapter. This is all nothing. Why are they fighting warnings? Incredible robot plunger to the rescue.
incredible Robo Funger kicks the TT 2000s touchy. The TT 2000 takes the plunge. Chapter 21 The Aftermath. The incredible Robo Plunger have defeated the evil Turbo Tola 2000, but George and Haro's problem weren't over yet. They reached into the crumpled mouth of the TT-2000 and pulled out their principal. What happened here? cried Mr. Crump. The school has been destroyed. The teachers are all unconscious. Now standing here in my underwear. Uh-oh, Carl whispered. Captain Underpants must have gotten toilet water on his head. He turned back into Mr. Principal Crump. George took Mr. Crump's clothes and tear out of his backpack and handed them to him. I'm ruined, Principal Crump whined as he dressed himself. I'm going to be held responsible for this mess. I'm going to lose my job. Maybe now, said George, you can fix everything and clean up this whole mess. Yeah, said Harold, but it'll cost you. Cost me what? Then asked Mr. Crump. Well, said George, we'd like you to cancel our detention and our suspension, and we'd also like to principal for the day. Said Harold. All right, said Mr. Crump. You can't really fix everything. You've got a deal. George and Harold turned and spoke to their incredible Robo Plunger. All right, Robo Guy, said George. Make yourself useful and pick up all this mess. Yeah, and fix up the school too, said Harold. Use your laser eyes to repair all the broken windows and stuff. And when you're done, said George, take all the evidence and fly it up to Uras. And don't come back, said Harold. Chapter 22, to make a long story short, the robot obeyed. Chapter 23, after the aftermath. The incredible robot plunger soared off into space just as the teachers began to regain conscience, consciousness. It just had to strain his dreams, said Miss Ribble. It was all about these evil toolists who wanted to take over the road. We had the same dream, too, said the other teachers. Whoa, said Mr. Crump. Things turned out all right after all. Not quite, said George. It's payback time. Chapter 24, Principles for the Day. For the Prevention, Convention, Detention, Suspension, Prevention. Attention, students, said George over the intercom the following day. This is Principal George. You're all excused from classes today. There will be no homework or tests, and everybody gets an A plus for the day. That's right, said Principal Harold. Also, we're hosting an all-day recess outside, complete with free pizza, french fries, cotton candy, the live DJ. Now go outside and play. Principal George and Principal Harold strode out to the playground to behold their glorious domain. George got a slice of pepperoni pizza with while Harold made himself a banana split at all all you can eat ice cream Sunday bar. It's good to be the principal, said George. Yeah, said Harold. Wish we could be principals every day. Later, George and Harold paid a visit to the unfortunate folks who were spending spend, spending all the day writing sentences in the detention room. While the teachers were there along with Mr. Crub and Melvis Neely. Mr. Krupp looked out the window at the Aldi recess celebration going on outside. Are your boys going to pay for all that ice cream and pizza? Yeah. Oh, we sold some stuff, said Harold. What did you sell? And Mr. Krupp. Your antique walnut desk and leather chair, said George. And all the furniture in the teacher's lounge. What? Green Mr. Krupp. Um, I think we better leave now, said Harold. Okay, what is he, what are they writing? I'll be very, 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 very nice, George the Great, and the amazing Harold. I'll be, yeah, they're just repeating. Okay. Oh, Melvin's writing, I will not be a tattletale, I will not be a tattletale, I will not be a tattletale. And, okay, I don't know what Miss Rebel is writing. I will stop being such a something. And Mr. Meaner is writing, I'll chill out, I'll chill out, I'll chill out. The Sanderson is writing, I'll get a... Yeah, I don't know. George and Harold left the detention room in a hurry. 
Miss Andrew snapped her fingers at them. Snap, get back here right now, he yelled. Oh, uh oh, said George. Then Miss Andrew Rope just snapped her fingers. Within seconds, Mr. Crow dashed out of the detention room and ran down the hallway toward his office. He had a goofy, heroic, old familiar looking smile on his face. Oh no, cried Harold. Here we go again, said George. Trillala. Okay. So that was the book I read. I hope you enjoyed watching this and please consider subscribing for more Captain Underpants book. I have also read some Geronimo Stilton books if you want to check that out too. Now I hope I can see you in the next one. Take care and bye.